Shelley. I'm from the Bureau of Meteorology. I'm part of a program, which is a very small program. There's only five of us, but we're called the Agriculture Program. So my job is to travel around the country and listen and learn about what your needs are, and then to play a role as the vo your voice inside the Bureau and inside the government and all of the other partners that we work with. I know that um, you know, it's fairly obvious the Bureau does forecasts and all those sorts of things, but we're here for a really um, a one main, a couple of main reasons. One is to benefit the Australian community, and a large part of that is safety. Um, we do have severe weather in this country um, that can cause loss of property and loss of life, so that's one of the reasons that we exist. But the other side to it is um, just to benefit and provide competitive advantage for industry uh, and businesses in Australia. We call that value and impact. So our KPI is actually about helping others derive benefit and profit. It's not about our organisation profiting more or getting money to our organisation. We're, we're a government funded organisation and that's our, that's our main appropriation. Um, this is the space that we work in order to do that. So we, we uh, at one end of the scale, we, we're providing um, forecasts for the days and weeks and months ahead. Um, and right at the other end, uh, we maintain the Australia's climate record, um, and that's all the way up to the you know the last few minutes where we've got our weather stations and things like that telling us exactly what's happening right now to give us that situational awareness. And so today I'm going to really talk about this um, past years and months, or years I should say, probably not months, um, and show you some of the things that we've been observing around Australia and particularly with respect to temperature. I'll also take you through um, a couple of, uh, I guess, concepts about climate um, and then we'll finish and, and I'll, I'll break that down into sort of what's been happening locally that we've observed in say the last 30 to 60 years um, and then we'll finish with talking about what the future might look like. So I'll start with talking about Australian climate observations. This is uh, what we've observed on average for the whole country. So this is where we pull all the data from around the whole country. And what you can see here is that uh, since about the sort of 70s and 80s, um, we've had this trend of average temperature across the nation. And you can see here where we are in 2020, on average, our temperatures increased by about one and a half degrees um, since that time. Um, now, you might say, um, well, okay, well, what does one and a half degrees really mean? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Because it's easy, it's easy to think, well, one and a half degrees, you know, in terms of, of us or our animals, it's, um, it's not, it doesn't sound like a lot. But it does have quite a lot of implications for what actually happens day to day. So this is probably the uh, most technical heavy thing that I'll present today, and I'll walk you through it. But if we just think of um, this sort of brown yellow line here, um, which is our normal distribution of temperatures, okay? The dotted line in the middle is the average. So let's just say that, our, that whatever that average is was um, some time ago. Um, within that distribution, what we get is uh, right at one end is what we call the extreme cold weather. And then right at the other end is what we get those hot days or heat waves and things like that, okay? But most of the time, it's around average. When we move the average just by a little bit, that one and a half degrees that I talked about, not only does it shift the average temperature, but it actually shifts the whole distribution of the types of temperatures that we experience. So there's two things that happen. One is that what we thought were cold days don't happen as much because we've shifted the curve that way. The other side to it is that we've shifted the curve forwards and what we used to think of as hot days happen a lot more often and things that never used to happen in our lifetime now happen. So they're the, the mid 40 temperatures and, and upwards in some parts of the country. So that's an important concept to think and that's why we get heat waves and it's why we get extended periods of, of higher temperatures than what we might have uh, used to get. And here's some of those observations. Again, this is all of the data for Australia pooled, but there's a couple of lines here showing 1951 to 1980, 1981 to 2010, and 2001 to 2015. And they're three different curves of observations starting to show that, that shift 
Um, this is also the frequency of heat waves in Australia. Again, it's pooled data. It's for the whole of Australia. It's not just one location, but it is showing um, that again, since the 70s, we started to see this um, big increase. And, and certainly um, 2019 uh, and the start of 2020, um, we, the, we probably experienced a lot of that, uh, those heat waves yourself. So what I'll do now is I'll break that down into what we've been seeing happening around here in the Murray Dairy region. And I've got a few locations where I've pulled some data um, just to show you exactly what that looks like at the local scale. And this is based on our weather stations. We don't have weather stations everywhere, of course, but we do have them in locations that are relevant. So what, what this is about is, um, you know, that weather station is not necessarily going to be in your backyard, but it's, so it's about uh, looking at the patterns of what you're seeing. It's not necessarily about exactly what happens on your property. This come, The work that we've done here comes from what we call uh, a climate guide. So in 2019, um, as part of the drought relief package, uh, the government funded a 12 month project for us to travel around. So I traveled around the whole country, um, did workshops with people like yourselves, and we developed it, what we call a climate guide. You've got a copy of the climate guide in your handout, in your handout today for the Murray region, and that's the Murray NRM region, and I know that that doesn't match the Murray Dairy region. Uh, but you can get climate guides uh, for all the other NRM regions around the country online. And I'm going to show you today um, some of the temperatures that we presented in that guide, um, and I've grabbed some of them uh, from outside of, of the, the specific climate guide as well, just to give you a, a bit more of a taste for what's happening around the region. But it compares two 30-year periods. So when we travelled around and asked farmers what they thought was a, a, a good way to present information, they told me that they felt that there were sort of two generations of farmers. There were those people who had been um, on, the, on the land, I guess, from, from about the... Uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, into the 90s, and then there are the newer generation that from the, the late 80s and 90s uh, had a, a slightly different experience on the land. So what we, what we did was we compared those two periods um, with our statistics. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'll just make sure I can see this slide. Yep. Okay, great. So, um, no, definitely skip slides. Sorry, everyone. Just give me a sec. Okay, good. So I'll start with the number of hot days. So um, we consider a hot day here to be 38 degrees. Now, you could choose any number that you want. You could choose 35, you could choose 40, um, you could choose 28 if you want. We chose 38 um, because that's what people told us was relevant to this region at the time. And all I've done here is I've just pulled out um, Daniloquin, Albury Airport, Echuca and Tatura. Um, and this is just a plot of how many times in the year the temperature was at least 38 degrees or greater. And this is for the whole history of that weather station record. So just, just to be clear, um, Daniloquin has got weather station temperature records from, from 1900. Um, the others are around about the late 50s uh, and, and six, early 60s, okay? So just keep that in mind, because um, it's, always, it's always relevant to um, uh, ask the question about how long the period of data is. You know, I could just show you that, and uh, that might not be appropriate. So it's always just worth being aware of that reference point. But look, what you can see here is sort of aligning with what I showed you before with the, the national trend of, of increasing average temperature. Um, we're starting to get this, this trend going upwards here from you know, sort of the mid-90s. In the number of times 38 degrees um, is exceeded at, at Echuca, it's a very similar pattern to Jura, um, Albury and, and Daniloquin as well. Of course, there's quite a bit of variability in there, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, but what we're showing here is the overall trend um, from the 90s. And that actually translates to... Look, just on that Tatura side, that weather station there, I believe, once upon a time, was stuck in the middle of an orchard, <laughs> taking the orchard away and talking to scientists there, naturally it warmed up by two degrees or so. That's just an observation. Yeah, look, we, we, we do have... Um, um, and look, that's really yeah. interesting, and, and I'll go back to that. We do have um, <laughs> processes... To, to check that. I couldn't comment on mm. specifically on Tatura, but 
Um, we definitely have processes to analyze all of these sites and take those sorts of things into consideration. I guess, I mean, even if we, even if we took the tour out of, of this plot, um, there's still enough of a, of a pattern from the other. And I think, it, you know, but it's worth noting again that um, it's about the pattern here. It's not necessarily um, going to be what's happening at every location, but it's pretty similar for all of them, right? So I guess that's the key take home message. Um, and it, look, it translates to THI as well. So the THI above 80 is what I'm plotting here. And really it's um, just a, a, the same sort of story in the number of days um, in, a, in a whole year. Um, and now look, naturally that's mostly going to be in the summer or in the warmer months. Um, but it's a, similar, it's a similar pattern in terms of the increase. So what it really means is that if 30 years ago you, um, you might have had, say, let's call it 10, 10 days a year where it was over 30 degrees or 10 days a year when it was over THI of 80, um, that's now increasing to something like 12 or, or 15 or something like that. And I've got a couple of examples of, of that. Um, look, before I get to that, sorry, I just forgot about this one, which is it also translates to warmer nights in this region. And we know that with dairy cattle, they can, they can withstand the high temperatures during the day, but if they don't get that relief overnight, that can be problematic. And particularly if that's a number of nights in a row. So yeah, look, here's just an example of what I was talking about before. So when we actually average that out um, between, so the first number on, on this map is um, the average number of days above 38 degrees um, in 1950, between 1959 and 1988, and then the average number between 1989 and, and 2018. And when we did this study, um, it was in 2019, so we only had the data right up to the end of 2018. Um, but you know, so Nilkin's kind of um, increased from 10 to 12. Um, you know, Aubrey and Rutherglen are at three or four up to seven. So it, it's, it means you've got a couple more days um, where you have to, we, we have to be able to manage that, that situation for, for your animals. The other thing that um, I talked about before is, the, and, and you know, 38 degrees isn't an extreme temperature. Um, it's a hot temperature, and it does happen. Um, but then, what, what, what I talked about earlier was when you shift that probability distribution, you then can get higher extreme temperatures. So um, here's just a couple of examples of what's been happening around the region. And um, Aubrey's had 44 degrees five times since 1989. Before 1989, they only experienced it twice in 68 and 82. Um, 38 degrees, seven days in a row, 2000. This happened in 2009. Again, it happened in 2014 and 2019. And that hadn't happened since 1939. So seven days in a row above 38. Um, Tatura, similar pattern, 43, three times since 89, uh, only once prior to 82. 40 degrees, four days in a row, um, which is the first time that it happened since the records began at Tatura in 1965. Um, rather than another similar story and a uh, you know, big string of um, 38 degrees, seven days in a row, 2014 and 2019. And that hadn't happened since uh, 1939. I suspect that these two are um, the stats on Aubrey and Rutherglen are probably the same uh, heat waves because the, the timing is very similar. So I'll talk a little bit now about what the future might look like. Here's another concept to be aware of when people talk about future projections for climate. When scientists do the modelling, um, so the only way we can predict or attempt to predict the future is through computer modelling. They prepare for or a, a series of different scenarios. Okay, so these scenarios are actually based on the amount of um, greenhouse gas emissions around our planet, and they're rated based on how much we do to mitigate that. So, us uh, what they call RCP 2.6 is where if if we took ambitious global action to quickly reduce emissions. Also note that these are about 10 years out of date and the, the next series of um, computer simulations are about to be released. But what that means is the low one, and this is just talking about um, how much of that greenhouse gas we have in the atmosphere. All right? At the higher end, basically the scenario is we don't, you know, human beings don't do anything to, to mitigate um, future climate. 
and, and greenhouse gas emissions, all right? And that one's called 8.5. Everything I've shown you today, so far, we are on the trajectory that is that particular scenario, and it matches up pretty well with all of the modelling that's been done over the last couple of decades. So here's, a, a, and again, I apologise, this is a little, this is, there's a lot going on here, but the thing to just keep in mind is um, you've got a few different areas where you've actually got these computer simulations of the, the shaded colour area. So this is where the computer has simulated, and the way, the way you've run these models is that before you, before you actually try to run them into the future, you try to model what's already happened, because that gives you a sense of whether or not you're, you're getting it right. So this blue sort of shaded area is where we've modelled the past, okay? And then the actual observations, this blue line where it jumps around, is what actually happened once we recorded that. So look, it's not an exact match, but it is, you know, thereabouts enough to give us some confidence about what then the future predictions might be when we run these models, okay? And so then this dark line is what we call the 20 year average. And those two um, lines, like, so the top represents that high scenario that I talked about, and then the bottom represents the low scenario. And at the moment, certainly through the 90s and 2000s, we've sort of been tracking on that higher scenario, and at the moment that trend is still um, pushing upwards towards that. So here's what the computer models are saying is the range of um, potential future scenarios. So even without changing anything, or even if we did take some action today to mitigate future climate, then there would still be um, some increase in temperatures. The trend that we're on would still continue at, at least for the, um, the, the immediate future. Dairy Australia has actually done some work on this. So uh, they asked the CSIRO to take those projections, those mathematical physics-based projections that have been done in the modelling in the past and do some analysis specifically for dairy. And they did it by region and you can get, there's a link in the handout to where you can get the report. But effectively what they've shown here is, um, so this is about um, the average temperature and the maximum and the minimum, and there's two there's two lots of data on the on the plots. The grey areas are what the average was between 1986 and 2005, and then these sort of pinky purple bars represent what the computer simulations predict between 2030 and 2049. Um, there's a couple of things to note. So <coughs> where you get these, um, if you get some overlaps, um, it means that. You know, there's a chance that what's still happening now, all right, can still be happening, but it tends to be at the lower end of what, what the average might look like in the future. The biggest take home message here is that it's predicted to be about 1.2 to 1.8 degrees warmer by 2040 in the Murray Dairy region. And most of that change is going to happen, predicted to be happen in the summer, not so much uh, in, in the winter. And so of course, summer is, is when it's probably the most concerning for, for running cattle. This is a bit of an overview um, in general about what we expect to happen across the nation um, for our future climate. Um, there's a whole range of things on there. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about tropical cyclones here, but I think the really big um, things to keep in mind are uh, warmer, more heat waves, fewer cool days, and there's also the longer uh, fire season um, and um, potentially more hazardous fire weather, and that's certainly something that um, I'm sure you all agree that the country has experienced uh, in the last couple of years, um, and that's, that unfortunately is the trend that is set to continue. A lot of the things I've shown you today in this presentation uh, come from a report that's just been released in the last two weeks. Um, it's a biennial report, comes out every two years, and it's a collaboration between the Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO, where we collaborate on the observations that we record and the CSIRO's modelling. Uh, it's called the State of the Climate, and if you go and have a read of that, you'll actually see a lot of the, the graphs that I've shown you are in that report. So if you want some more information, um, that's, a, that's a, a good place to start. Here's the climate change impacts on dairy regions in Australia that was written by CSIRO in 2016, I think. 
Um, you can get that from Dairy Australia's website under the Dairy Climate Toolkit and there's a link there for that in your handout as well. And I'll finish on this. Um, this is the Bureau's campaign that we call Know Your Weather, Know Your Risk. And we've put together a series of information packages online around bushfires, droughts, floods, cyclones, thunderstorms and heat waves. Um, it's bomb.gov.au, know your weather, and you can go there and there's a series of YouTube videos and other information packages that you can use just to understand a little bit more if, you, if, you, if you'd like to get some more information. So yeah, my name's Christy Giacomo. I work at um, Melbourne University. So I am a lecturer in animal nutrition mainly um, and a bit of animal physiology. Um, and my knowledge of heat stress goes back um, quite a while. So I did my PhD looking at heat stress in ruminants, mainly dairy cows. Um, and a little bit of, well, actually, dairy cows and sheep, and I snuck one beef study in there that I'm not a beef expert, so please don't ask any beef questions. Um, and, yeah, so I've been working on heat stress for, um, I guess, the decade since then. So Melbourne Uni has quite a large pro um, program looking at different research elements of the physiology of pig stress, but also how to ameliorate it um, across all species. So I'm on the ruminant side, but I have colleagues that work in pigs and poultry um, as well. So we do quite a bit of space, like quite a bit of research in this space. and work collaboratively with other big universities like the University of Queensland and have quite a big heat stress program as well. Um, so yeah, feel free to fire random questions at me, I may be able to answer. So I will skip over this because it's, it's demonstrated differently, but this is exactly what Luke just said, talking about the averages um, moving, meaning that we get more extreme days. And the next couple of days coming up is a perfect example of that. Um, and again, Luke also said it there, um, oh, and I think Ross said in the introduction that they're not having cooling overnight is the problem for the animals. So once we get these hotter days and then the temperature doesn't drop down. So tonight, I think around here, it's going to get down to about 16. The cows will be okay. But overnight tomorrow night, um, it's not going to get below 25. And that's when you'll find the real problem, um, especially for lactating animals. So more of that is going to just really increase this problem going forward. Sorry, I'm probably flopping. Terrible. Um, so we know, you guys all know this, um, you've probably heard of pigs restaurants before, and of course you work in the area, you know that it costs you money, right? So that's the biggest thing. If your milk production drops, if your growth rate drops, if all of those things, um, that's, you know, that's bottom line, so that's not good. It's also impacting the animal welfare, which from a social licence to farm, the general public don't like that. Um, none of us like our animals to not be happy and healthy. So, um, you know, these are all issues that kind of roll into something, um, a whole lot of the issues that we see around heat stress. Um, fertility, I'm not a fertility expert and I don't have too much in here, but I will talk a little bit about that um, and some of the relationships with heat stress and fertility that we know about. Um, and then, yeah, so all of these responses can also be seen in future generations and I'll show a little bit of that later on as well. But it's expensive, so estimates across the world are billions of dollars. We really don't know. It's really hard to get a grasp on the actual cost, um, but it does cost money. So from loss of production, but also mitigating technologies and feeds and things that we have to change to get, it, um, to get our animals to cope. So again, we know that heat stress causes a reduction in milk yield and also sometimes milk quality, which is a problem. Um, in sheep, you'll see a reduction in wool and tissue growth and a change in wool quality. Again, that's a real problem, especially if you're growing fine wool merinos or something nice. Um, meat quality, I put a question mark around it. We actually have a couple of postgrads working on this at the moment and it's a bit, it's both difficult to measure and a bit equivocal. So um, the, the idea is that there's definitely um, issues around meat quality um, and certainly if the animals are transported on really high heat days so they can have a high body temperature when they're slaughtered then that rate of pH drop of the meat causes problems with the meat quality there so definitely issues around that and again you might have a cow that grew perfectly but then if it's damaged at slaughter um, that's no good for anyone's eating quality and that can cause more you know follow-on production loss um, and money loss. Feed intake is probably the largest problem that drives a lot of these the sort of metabolic problems, uh, changes that I'll talk about. Um, but the, the reduction in feed intake when animals are hot is what's causing most of these issues. So we all know, you and I, you know, tomorrow, 44 degrees around here, you're not going to go outside and have a hot roast dinner, um, except on Christmas Day. It's the stupidest Australian tradition why we have. <laughs> So insane, I just don't get it. Um, but you don't, so the cows feel the same, right? It gets hot, they don't want to eat a lot. And at Dukey, um, at our Melbourne University Research Dairy, we have a robotic dairy, so the cows can voluntarily come in whenever they like. We note that during summer, they really do come in later and later. So they're not coming in at that 5 or 6 p.m., they'll come in at 11 o'clock or midnight, which means their intake might not drop as much because they'll get their grain 
in the dairy and they'll happily eat it. Um, but in conventional farms where you're not doing that, you can, you know, the cows might not eat their full wheat ration or whatever you're giving them at that time. Um, and then in the paddock, they might not want to graze because they're staying under the trees in the shade or whatever shade's provided. Um, and so they're just reducing their intake overall, and especially if there's no nighttime cooling. So if it's hot overnight, they still don't feel like eating um, during that night period. Reproductive performance I've already talked about. And then um, something else that's probably not really quantified as often in heat stress is an increase in mortality and infection. So you do get cows that die. Um, I'm gonna talk about the issues around oxidative stress and that has follow on effects around inflammation. That's an entire talk unto itself. Um, but you see problems, cows change their behavior. So they might, I mean, these sheep are hanging around the edge of the water there, but they might get in. Cows will wallow. We had a cow yesterday, Duke, it was only 33 degrees, but she was getting in the water trough. Um, that's unhygienic and that can lead to lots of other illnesses that can then be exacerbated. So again, hard to quantify, but something worth thinking about as well. But of course, we know dairy animals are really susceptible. Um, milk yield can decrease 10 to 15 percent during heat stress, even when there's cooling. And I've got lots of data to show that um, coming up. I like to put this slide in because our infrared cameras um, are really pretty and they show great images. My line of science, I don't get to show many fun graphs, but this is what I like. Um, so this is actually a cow down at Ellen Bank a few years ago now, um, but this was in November and I believe it was only, this was early in the morning, 10 or 11, well, not super early, 10 or 11 a.m., um, but it was only about 22, 23 degrees. And so this is a typical, you know, Holstein Frasier girl here. What this shows really nicely is the, so yellow eye is hotter, and you can see here that where she's got that white patch um, equates to less hot, that just makes sense, black cows get hotter, but then we bleed, we breed these black Holstein Frisians to go and stand in a paddock in full solar radiation. It's a bit silly, um, but then there's obviously reasons why you don't want full white cows either. Um, but she's, you know, so 23 degree day in full sun. The area um, around her back there over her hip bones is 45 degrees Celsius. So, you know, that's not even a hot day and she's standing in full sun getting very hot. So um, that's why I like to highlight that here. Um, and we use this information for lots of other things, but that's that's a hot cow. She's not panting or anything, she's actually fine, um, but you know, to touch her skin, she'd be quite hot and she'd be approaching that level. So I talked about the reduction in feed intake leading to part of the problems with heat stress, but there are complicated mechanisms that I'll touch on here. I'm not going to give you a crash course in physiology, um, but a lot of it is driven by that reduction in intake, but also some metabolism and hormone changes that both drive the reduction in intake, but are also contributing to other things that are occurring. One of the big ones that we see um, is a redistribution of blood to extremities. So again, what's happening is the animal's hot, so it's trying to push its blood to the skin so that that heat exchange through the skin to the air can occur. Particularly if there's, um, now that's what to do with, there's some really great information on the Dairy Australia website around heat exchange. And in that little guide, I had a cool cow's guide, there's some pictures that show this really well. But if the air temperature's low enough, they can dissipate heat to the environment and cool their blood down. Now, um, animals can also do this through countercurrent heat exchange in the brain, so they can get, they can breathe in cooler air and it cools the brain, which is really helpful, obviously. Um, but yeah, they push all of their blood towards the extremities. Humans do this too, you probably feel a bit different. But what that means is there's less blood flow to the gut. So the stomach is not acting, not exchanging nutrients as well as it should. It's not, um, things aren't moving as much as they should. All of that is causing other problems, and that's where we get to um, things like leaky gut. Now, I'm sure if anyone's heard anyone talk about heat stress before, you've heard leaky gut. I did part of my PhD um, at the University of Arizona with Lance Bongard um, and Bob Collier, and they're the big kind of people that found that, that, um, that heat stress is a disease of the gut. So all that blood flow is coming from the middle going out, and that's causing internal problems as well, and also signaling. So hormones move around the body via the blood. If the blood's not moving the way it normally would, those signaling systems stop. And we're still learning about the microbiome. The rumen microbiome is exceptionally not well understood even at all. Uh, we barely understand the human one. So there's probably a whole lot of triggers and signals that we don't even know about yet that will be occurring too. Um, so that caused damage to, to gut, tish, uh, gut tissue. Increased maintenance energy costs. So the animal's panting, she's changing her behavior. That's costing um, energy, that's inefficient. Um, so she's needing more energy just to keep herself alive. Reduced production of um, volatile fatty acids, and this is a really interesting one. So they did some studies where they had fistulated cows and they put them in a um, heat stress environment, and obviously they stopped eating, but they force fed the cows. So through the fistula, it managed to put food back in to keep her intake level what it was in a cool climate, and they still produced fewer volatile fatty acids. So there's something going on in the rumen that's not just driven by her not eating. 
there's other things occurring. So reduced VFA production means reduced energy, means reduced milk, means all of those things that we know about. I mentioned the microbiome, um, again, not enough information on that. And then stuff that we just don't know. I mean, there's, there's got to be stuff going on that, that no one's found a way to measure yet. So, the counter-current heat exchange I was talking about through the brain. Um, we know that the cow will increase her cooling mechanisms, so she'll pant, her heart rate will go up as she moves that blood flow around. And you'll see that as um, once those mechanisms don't keep her cool enough, you'll see an increase in skin temperature and rectal temperature or core body temperature. What that then does is triggers all of these decreased heat production mechanisms. We get an induction of HSPs as heat shock proteins. So these are signal proteins that move around the body. Um, they have lots of different jobs, but they essentially protect the cell from dying and stop proteins from dying. All of these other things I've talked about, changes in activity, um, all of this happens. So I really highlighted, this is some old work, um, it's actually from before I was born, that's how old this work is, um, but shows really well the um, change in blood flow in, this is in a heat stressed um, sheep, I believe, and you can see that all of that, a lot of the reduction, so the red is obviously 40 degrees, look at all of this around the gut, like that's just a really massive change in blood flow, so that's, that's having really big impacts. So this is some um, research that I did. This is the heat chambers in the University of Arizona. Um, they're amazing. We don't have anything like it in Australia. Alan may have those, but in Arizona, they can actually control solar radiation as well. So that's crazy um, having that impact because in, in the chambers we use here, we don't get that. And obviously I showed that earlier slide of the black cow in the sun, so that has an impact. But these cows were knocked around pretty hard. Um, Thermoneutral cows were at 18 degrees, but the heat stressed cows were at 29 to 40 degrees the whole time. It never got below 29 degrees even at night because we were stimulating in Arizona heat stress because the desert gets really hot. Um, but you can see there, so first seven days of thermoneutral and then that bottoming out of milk yield after seven days. And if we follow that graph out, so she was, they were heat stressed for those three weeks, or two weeks, sorry, a uh, week of thermoneutral. If you followed that back and put them back out in a normal environment, their milk yield would go up, but it would not go back up to what it was sooner. So you've knocked them about, you've, you've kind of ruined that. Um, Sorry, Christy. Yes. So, so you're saying so you started at that temperature and took the seven days before? No, sorry, these first seven days, they were at, nine, they were at 18 degrees. Oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then so day zero is when the heat was turned on turned and then it yep. bottomed down. So it took about a week to get to its lowest yep. and then it stayed there. Yeah. But that was, again, no, no overnight respite from anything. Those cows, yep. were, they were really hot. We were pulling cows out every day and hoping them down. Um, but this is some of the classic work out of Lance Bonegrad's group that showed, again, I'll try not to get too heavy on some of the full on metabolism in this. Um, I am an academic, so I'll probably go a bit too far, but um, this is the, so if they're matched, they're eating the same amount of food, you can see here in the top. So this is their milk yield. So the thermoneutral cows, milk yield didn't change, but the heat stress did, even though they're eating the same, they're paired fed. So those thermoneutral cows were given less food than they would like to eat, but they still managed to produce milk. Now that's obviously them using body storage, they're using protein or fat from around their body to keep that milk yield up, but the heat stressed cows aren't doing that. And what is happening is they're not using or responding to insulin the way they normally would. So I'm sure everybody knows insulin helps control blood glucose levels, um, glucose triggers insulin release to keep everything at a, at a steep state. It's a little bit more complicated in ruminants, but that's kind of the basic of it. And again, you can see the difference here. So the heat stress is the dotted line. Um, the thermoneutral animals did not increase their insulin like the heat stress cows did. And that's because they're not responsive. So their cells are seeing that insulin, but they're not reacting to it. So she has to produce more and more to try and get that plasma glucose back to where it needs to be, which is obviously really important for brain function, but it's in a milk animal. Glucose is what drives milk production and lactose production, right? So if you're getting that wrong, you're gonna have huge impacts on milk yield. So this is a summary slide again. This is from like, you know, my entire four years of PhD <coughs> in one slide. Um, but the heat stress cows had a reduction in some growth hormones, um, plasma fatty acids, so non esterified fatty acids. They had a reduction in those. They weren't mobilizing fat like they should. Um, growth, yeah, growth hormone signaling. But they had increases in insulin, increase in plasma urea nitrogen, which is an indicator that they were using protein as an energy source instead of fat. So instead of mobilising their fat stores, they're eating their muscle um, and other sources of protein. And that's probably not what you want, particularly in a beef animal, but definitely in any animal. Increasing prolactin, which is an interesting one. So prolactin has a role in reproduction, of course, 
um, but also has a role in water metabolism and keeping um, cells hydrated. But the reproduction role is really, really not well understood in um, ruminants and especially in relation to heat stress. So I think that's something, and it's something we're doing a little bit of research on in our group, but that's, that needs a whole lot of work. Um, yeah, so I won't go through that anymore, but you see overall a reduction in responsiveness to growth hormones, um, reduction in that fat mobilisation, increase in breakdown of um, skeletal muscle. Now, I probably need to hurry up. I won't go through this, you've got it in front of you, it's just a bit of a summary slide of all of those processes, but it highlights really well that it's not a, you know, it's, it's the whole system that's getting changed, it's not just one location. Sorry, yeah. just, just, sorry, just to go back on the other one, so you're talking about growth, Hormone. So if you're looking at young stock, mm -hmm. so potentially the effect, because I think a lot of we, we tend to always be concentrating on our dairy cows yep. because we see them physically in front of us, they're panting. Yep. So, um, so the effect on growth rate for those cows, so, so have you done any work, sorry, you might get there. I will, uh, yeah, I'll show a little bit. I haven't, but Jeff, da Jeff Dahl's group had at the University of Florida, um, a kind of the eminent group doing that research, looking at growing stock. Um, and there are, I don't know if it's exactly related to growth hormone, but I'm sure it would contribute. Um, but there's definitely problems. So heat stress, I do have some slides. Um, but oh, heat, right. heat stress Sorry. cows will, um, oh, we'll wait, I'll get there. I've got some trouble. But anyway, lots of stuff going on. We also know, as I alluded to, that heat stress can impact the immune system. Um, and again, this is what Lance Bogard's group in the US is doing a lot more research on now. Um, but you get that leaky gut, so all of those microbes in the gut getting out into the blood system and causing problems, but also a change in oxidative capacity, so the animal can't buffer those shocks as well as it should be able to. So she's more susceptible to getting sick. Um, increased susceptibility that I already talked about, but busy immune system. So the immune system's fighting off other stuff already. Something that she might have been able to handle previously and not get sick from will suddenly <coughs> cause that cow to get sick. Oxidative stress I mentioned, and um, one of my colleagues, Serena Chohan, who's the last reference there, um, has done, he did his, his PhD on antioxidants and continues to work in that space. Um, but you see this imbalance of oxidative capacity. So oxidants and antioxidants, you want that balance. So oxidant, um, oxidant production need to be, they need to be scavenged and removed from the body. And that system breaks down during heat stress as well. So you get oxidative damage to cells. So it's yet another way that those cells are dying. Um, and that's why antioxidants can work. So um, antioxidant feed supplements, and I've got, I'll talk a little bit about those. And so this is some of Jeff Dahl's work. So Cal is one of Jeff Dahl's PhD students. Um, and this is him looking at carryover effects. So this is in adult cows, but um, just to show you here the, what, the open bars are the cows that were pulled during heat stress and the, the closed bars are the cows that weren't. And that's the milk yield of the season after that. So that's not during, this is the season after. Um, so they've studied these cows long term and you can see that there's, there's are lots of studies that have shown that, um, but milk production in subsequent lactations is down, right? So there's something going on systemically. It's probably damage to hormonal systems, but also memory um, carryover effects. So they really think it's driven by increased mammary cell death. Um, so yeah, decreased mammary cell proliferation. So the memory is not, not um, responding as well as it should in the future. So if the cow gets damaged enough, that's long-term problems. It was also interesting that Christy with the um the epigenetic changes in like calves, you know, absolutely for life. And, yeah. and, and when he was out, and actually yeah. we're talking about that, I was sort of raised about the fact that you know we've got such an ordinary calving herd mm -hmm. in our different systems as well that you know our, our annual production is sitting under six thousand litres. Epigenetically, we're changing from that. Um, that, that absolutely, heat stress, absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah. So Jeff Dahl was down a few years ago. If any of you got to catch him, I also sit on the committee of the AARN. Um, and so we brought Jeff out and he made some brilliant presentations. So if you're double ARN members, you can watch those online. Um, give a plug. I'm the treasurer. <laughs> um, yeah, so in utero heat programming can also happen. So outside the womb, but also inside the womb. So I'm not sure if anyone's heard of prenatal programming. It happens in humans as well, but we're a little bit more, uh, we're less susceptible to it. We're a bit more plastic, we can take changes. Um, but animals, can't as well. So sheep are really susceptible and dairy cattle or cattle are as well. Um, so a hot mum can change the calf and then if you're, you know, if that's a replacement heifer, that calf is already on the back floor. So you see reduced birth weight and weaning weight, don't need to explain why that's a problem, you all understand that. Increased 
immunoglobulin apparent absorption. So they're not able to take up those um, antibodies from the um, colostrum from mum. So already, small cow, and then she doesn't get her antibodies, right? So you've got problems. So that leads to decreased heart survival. And then later on, she'll have decreased reproductive performance. So I talk about this, I talk about prenatal programming a lot in my lectures, but um, humans, it's all animals. When female animals are born, you're born with all of your eggs, right? Sperm is constantly being made, but eggs are, are born. So when you're when the female's in utero, those eggs are developing. So they're, if they're stressed then, then the next generation's already damaged. So if you have big problems, you can grade, you can blame your grandma, is kind of my take home message from that. It's what grandma did when you were in, in utero. So that, you know, you're affecting multiple generations there. Potentially increased adipose tissue deposition. Now in beef animals, that's a real problem. In our lactating animals, that can be as well because they're not mobilized for fat. Um, and then they get hotter as well because they've got that fat layer. And then of course, decrease of production. So I've told you all the doom and gloom. What can we do to fix it is probably more what you want to hear from me. Um, there's no perfect answer. And I like to separate it in these three ways. So you can change what the animal's experiencing. You can feed them differently or you can try to breed them differently. So I'm not talking about genetics in this talk, um, but there is a whole lot of people out of um, AgVic that research in this area. Um, there's, a, there's a whole lot of publications around that, but they um, have shown that we obviously know that Bosphorus and Bosphindicus cattle react differently, but we're not going to be able to change the breed of cattle that we use at that kind of level in Australia. So interesting, but in the real world, it's not going to have any impact, right? So we just, we'll forget about that. But that's true at a cellular level, so there's potential to be manipulating those processes genetically. Um, so, you know, the boss, um, the boss Taurus cattle might be able to borrow some methods from the boss Indian cattle to get better at coping with that, but not at the moment. But potential for breeding more resistant animals is a really interesting one, and this is where um, the, the group out of Ellen Bank um, and others in Bundura Acme have done some really great work. So. They were accurately able to select or to predict for heat tolerance and then select for it as well. So it's it's a breeding value, you can look it up, um, you can select your animals based on their tolerance. And how they looked at that was they looked at, I think it was four days either side of a heat wave, and they measured the cows that didn't, they all dropped milk production, but the cows that didn't drop milk production as much were called her heat tolerant. And so they're the ones that you can select for. So the ones that somehow are able to cope with that heat and not. Yeah, not decrease. So this works, um, and there's lots of research on genetics. But again, a more longer term kind of goal, and it's true for everything that if you select for one thing, you can often be deselecting for another. We all know this in the dairy industry: selecting for high reproduction, um, high milk production led to low reproduction, right? So we all know that that can go really wrong, and that can be the same for this. So we don't necessarily understand how they're pulling off that ability to produce more milk. Is it at the detriment of other? processes we don't know so you have to think about that in your breeding programs. Shade works again research from well before I was born um, but 30 to 50 percent reduction in heat load 10 percent more milk shade really works right the problem with shade is how do you do it so you've got paddocks you need access you need races you need runs you need you know to move your animals around paddocks I understand the complexity of that um, and you need to this shade um, in your cook house as well, all this is covered, so that's a really good guide. But um, trees is the best way because they create a heat sink as well, so they take some um, heat out of the atmosphere, so they provide the shade, but they also cool the area. Um, but that's a long term goal, you know. The best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago, but if you haven't done that, maybe do one now um, and help the next generation. But of course, can't do it always. Design is really important though, there's no point you putting shade on if it's too. Um, too low, then the animals will just get hotter under it in some cases. If there's not enough, they'll crowd under it and then they'll get body heat from each other. Um, the design of the shade is really, really important and there's lots of research and again, that cool pile of guy has a little bit about it. Not relevant for this area, but shade is obviously not useful in tropical heat. When it's humid, the shade's not going to help. Um, and it's not as useful in sheep, so sheep are crazy, they just won't use it. They, um, their wool is a bit of UV protection, but they'll just hammer around and some sheep will use it, some sheep just won't give a crap, but like dairy cows will use the shade. Um, sprinklers and fans work again. This is what that girl was doing at Dookie yesterday. That's not yesterday, but um, same, same idea, getting into the, the, um, the water pool there. Um, sprinklers and fans work, so it can um, increase milk yield. I mean, not a huge amount, but nearly a kilo there. Decrease rectal temperature about two degrees, and that's what's going to have a massive impact um, on all of those internal processes. So sprinkling before entering shade, so the combination of sprinklers and shade, this is why sprinklers under um, the milking parlour is really useful. They actually really do help. Um, feeding times, 
this, you know, great research works, but grazing animals, how the hell do you manage this, right? You can't. So you just kind of take it with a grain of salt and we do our best. But if you change feeding times of grain where you can, again, hard in the dairy system because you're feeding them in the dairy, um, but, you know, that does impact because their, their peak heat production is about three hours after eating, so that's when all that peak fermentation in the room is happening, they're getting hotter. If you can manipulate that to not be around the peak heat of the day, right? Um, but practically, you know, you can see improvements in feeding take, um, but, you know, I don't think people are going to get out on their tractors and feed cows at 2 a.m., so it's just not really that relevant. Fibre is one that's shown to work well, um, reducing fibre intake because of that heating per minute feeding, so the metabolic cost of digesting fibre causes more heat. Okay, it's hotter, so if you can change that, that can be helpful. Um, but it's not always true. High roughage can decrease body temp um, because the animal eats less overall. It's a bit of a catch-22, but it does help. Um, but we do, you know, you don't want to manipulate things too far, so you will understand the importance of fibre for buffering and other things. So it's a hard one to do practically, but it can improve, um, can improve production. Concentrate feeding, so um, pretty common to bump up the energy density of your feed. So you know the cow's eating less, so you want to get more energy into there, into the supplement she's getting in the dairy during heat stress. So this might be by adding fat. Um, the data around this, the research around this is a bit up and down. Some show improvements for milk yield, some don't. But generally it's considered to be a positive thing. Of course you need to get the right levels of fat, but 3 to 5% is kind of what, um, what is understood to be the best. Um, but yeah, we know the problems of excess fat as well. So, um, yeah, generally accepted to be beneficial to add fat. And then short um, chain fatty acid supplementation is um, something that's having a bit of research. It's in research, I would almost say as well. That can lead to decreased body temperatures and increasing milk production. So this is some work from Paula Gonzalez, who finished her PhD at Melbourne a couple of years ago now. Um, but she looked at feeding different types of diets to heat stress sheep, not cattle, but um, it does, Ellen Bank did a bit of work in dairy cows and showed similar results. Um, but you can see that the wheat is in blue and the corn is in red. So the cows eating corn has lower, um, this is rectal temperatures, so body temperature, that holds true for respiration rates and everything. So the fermented heat produced from digesting the corn was less than that from wheat. So she just didn't get as hot from eating that. Um, Dietary supplements, and again, this is something I do quite a lot of research on, um, but they work, they can often be fast and easy-ish, but generally, you know, dairy cows are being fed some sort of mixed diet, so you can add a supplement into that, um, compared to longer term or, you know, um, beef cows where they're out in pasture can be harder, but for dairy cows, at least we do get them in daily, we can give them some stuff. Um, cost effective, generally, um, again, probably not every supplement on the planet is, but a lot of them are. Um, but you do need to carefully manage the dose rate of them. So too much of a good thing is no longer a good thing. And that's true for all of these supplements that we talk about. Um, so I've talked about fat. I'll talk about a few more of these. And again, there's a lot of these tested in your full cow's diet too. So I did my PhD looking at betaine. Um, betaine in ruminants is really commonly fed now. It probably wasn't back then. Really commonly fed in pigs and poultry as well, where you see really, you know, really equivocally instant results. It's a bit harder to see that in ruminants, but you certainly see a benefit. Um, so it's a natural product um, derived from sugar beets and it leads to improvements in average daily gain. So that's different doses of betaine there um, and in milk production that I'll show. So sorry, I know I'm probably going over time, so I'm going to go through this. No, no, you're fine. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you were fine. Okay. This is, I, yeah. Um, this is our Jaduki dairy, so this was a few summers ago now, um, but this is looking at control versus 15 kilos of BT cows. And you can see here that these are, I could overlay them if I probably should. Um, these will be the high heat days where milk yields dropped off, um, probably no overnight cooling there. Um, but those cows that were fed BT, they still dropped milk production, but nowhere near as much as the control cows, right? So that was just 15 grams of BT per cow per day in dairy. Um, and that had a massive improvement in milk yield. And that's been shown across, yep. So is that, so is it timing, like consistently having the betaine put in yeah. or is it? This was, I, you bring up a good point because after listening to Luke, I was thinking about that. Um, the fact that forecasting is not great for, you know, four days is perfect, but no one, you can't change your ration every four days, right? That's just not good. So things like this, if it's cost effective, whack it in for the whole summer. I mean, if it works out for you economically on your farm, just keep it in there, it's not doing any harm. Um, and it's actually, I've got some data. 
if I left it in, data about in um, non-heat stress conditions, betaine is still useful, so you're not causing any problems. But um, for some of the other supplements that are a little bit more expensive, it might be more cost effective to pull them in and out around you know, extreme heat days. It's just the practicality of doing that. So I think that some of these feed companies might need to start looking in delivery methods, right? So is it is it something that can easily be top dressed, for example, or I don't know. Like, but if you're putting it in a pallet, it's harder to put a plan forward. Um, but yes, this was, so you, you do see, um, betaine does start working almost instantly. So as soon as the animal's digesting it, I would always recommend a day or two. We do all of our research with a seven day washing, but that's because it's science and we do everything to, you know, a, a schedule. Um, but on a, on a real farm, a day or two is probably fine. Um, and then, yeah, this, is, this was fed across the whole summer. We've just shown it's also not a bit here. Um, and this is the Rookie around the thermoneutral condition. So this is not heat stress house, this is work out of the US. Um, but you can see that they had milk yield improvements even when they weren't heat stressed. This was a dose response. I would never recommend feeding 70 grams per day. We've shown that there's problems with that, so don't go to that level. But we did show benefits of 15 grams a day, right? So you don't need to. This is some of the earlier work um, looking into the doses, but did see improvements in milk yield. Um, and this is some of my work, this is clicking over to beef cattle, sorry, um, but I did show again the dose response in the beef cows, so this was um, overlaid with shade as well, um, but you can see that there was sort of a sweet, a sweet spot between 10 and 20, which is how we've landed on 15, um, of where there's an improvement in this is carcass weight, um, and then it starts to decline once we went to the higher levels of detain, um, because the body's having to mobilise other things to excrete it. So um, beneficial in non-lactating animals as well. So betaine is a really good one, right? It's common, it's available, it works. Um, this is some of Syringa's work that I alluded to earlier, looking at antioxidants. So there's lots of different antioxidants and there's lots of different ways to get antioxidants. If you think about it from a human perspective, antioxidants are in all of our fruits and vegetables. And so same idea for ruminants, right? You can get different sources. So there's fruit-based products and there's other purified, um, purified things. So this was studies looking at selenium and vitamin E, which are two of the more common. Um, antioxidants that are used and you can see that this was in sheep not cattle um, but we did see that they stopped they didn't stop eating so this was um thermo neutral versus when they get heat stress these control animals didn't get the antioxidants but the cows uh, sorry the sheep that did didn't stop eating as much right and so that's going to lead to i didn't show it all here but that obviously means they didn't lose as much body weight um, and all of that and if this is a lactating animal potentially she might not have lost as much weight here. So that's an interesting one. And this is the same study, um, but that was being pulled off by the animal not being as hot either. So her body temperature of the sheep didn't get as high, and therefore they felt more comfortable and ate more and all those flow on effects. Um, some others that we talk about is chromium and insulin enhancers. So I mentioned earlier, and that's a very scary diagram, don't worry about it. Um, but insulin changes, responsiveness to insulin changes in heat stressed animals. So if we can manipulate that pathway and make them back to being responsive to insulin, um, then that's a huge benefit because they start using their metabolism the way it was designed to and they start um, responding to those triggers. So there's things like chromium and zinc. Um, and it's not the only way they work, but it's part of how they work is by changing this insulin signaling or improving this insulin responsiveness. So these guys work, there's lots of different um, products around these as well. Um, there's other things like TZDs and Vandium, I won't go through those, but their TZD is like a, um, it's a diabetic type drug that people yeah, use. So there's, yeah, there is research on oh, yeah, those, right. but some of those are um, really fast acting, the body metabolizes them really quickly, and so you would need to consistently with doses. Whereas things like chromium and zinc do work more so in a food delivery type system. Um, yeah, and chromium. So we've shown um, Alex, another one of our PhD students who graduated a few years ago, showed that chromium increases dry matter intake in heat stress sheep. So if you feed them chromium, they eat better. Um, and again, I'm not aware, we haven't done any work with chromium in dairy cattle, um, but you know, it would likely carry over. And this is my last slide. And again, it's not, it's a lot, sorry, but this was a nice review I found published last year. Um, and this was looking at, this is in sheep, not dairy either, but they just did a meta-analysis. So they pulled all of the published work around the world on different heat stress treatments um, and ran them through some analysis together. So um, this top bar is a control animal that's heat stressed and give no intervention at all. And these, these are a whole lot, it's not very clear on here, sorry. These are a whole lot of um, different types of supplement. And this is an animal that's not heat stressed. So this is what we're trying to get to. And so some of these, this is a massive combination. Um, vitamin E, selenium, zinc, um, cobalt, chromium, 
I'm not sure if anyone's putting all of that into their diet, but it works if you can afford it, right? Um, but different things that I'll point out. So B, B chains here, look, the animal still is hot, but it's much reduced than it was otherwise. Um, there's some things I didn't talk about, manipulating different types of hay, for example. Um, fat supplementation really works. You can see that one there. Um, and then what was the other one that I wanted to point out? Seaweed is an interesting one. So um, AgriFutures is doing a bit more research on seaweed these days. Um, it's cost prohibitive at the moment. It's really expensive because we can't produce it very efficiently. Um, but there's some interesting research. And if we can find the active form of that and somehow produce it cheaper, that might be a way to go in the future. So watch this space.